Fireside Chat, episode 24, Turning Up the Music, recorded October 14th, 2013. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat, featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. Happy Thanksgiving! It's Dan, Matt, and Luke here for another episode of Fireside Chat. This is our Thanksgiving episode being recorded Monday night. And we've just uh, finished a week where the Flames picked up two more wins. They won against the Canadians and against the Devils. They now have eight of a possible ten points so far, sitting tied for second in the Pacific Division. Do you guys ever think we'd be saying that? Tied for second? Well, you know it's the first couple weeks of the season (laughs) when... I definitely thought this team had a fast start in it, uh, especially playing with very little pressure, and I'm sure a lot of teams looking past them. But it's going to be interesting to see how they deal with adversity when it does start to mount and when someone actually starts to put a second defense pairing out against uh, Stepniak, Berchi, and Monaghan. I haven't checked the stats, um, but I know traditionally just... From what I can remember, the Flames usually start off pretty bad. So I, I haven't checked the stats to know when the last time we've had this go to start uh, is we haven't. ever. No, uh, the f- getting points in the first five games has never been done in Flames history, both Atlanta and Calgary. Wow, so the Flames, of all years to break a record, I bet this is not the year we were expecting a record to be broken. No, for sure. Although apparently, listening to Peter Marr talk about this, uh, there was a game at I'm not sure if it was the Stanley Cup year, but they lost a game in overtime, but at the time that wasn't worth a point, and then they carried on a point streak, so if you operate under today's rules back then, the point streak would exist, but it doesn't, so congratulations to the 2013 Calgary Flames for setting a record. 2013-14 Calgary Flames. And the Flames have a bit of a break now. It's uh, Monday the 14th. They're, uh, they've been off since Saturday. They'll play again Wednesday in Anaheim, albeit that game. And then they got a couple days off, and they're in San Jose. So this is, a, if you look at the schedule for this month, fairly light month for them, only one back-to-back game. And that might be a good thing for this team. Gives them a lot of practice time and time to look at what's working and what's yeah, not. Yeah, especially with the addition of Joel Colborn. It allows him to get more in tune with how the flame system operates and realistically getting more time to work on the rough edges with like all those leads that the flames were squandering you know getting more practice time to address that will help i will i will say this that joe colburn is this road trip away from i think uh being replaced by corbin knight or at least giving knight a look because colborn's looked fairly meh but he hasn't, he's, you know, obviously hasn't had a training camp, so let's not hold that too much against him, but he's got to start showing something. And I think that's the beauty of the spot that the Flames are in this year is they have a lot of flexibility salary cap-wise um, to bring guys up and down and try guys out and say, okay, Joe, you know, we're going to sit you down, we're going to try um, night, and if that doesn't work well, then we'll put, we'll put you back in the lineup. We're also ahead of the Canucks right now in the standings, which I don't think anyone was expecting either, that the Flames would be ahead of the Canucks in the Pacific Division. It's always good to see the Oilers and the Canucks in the basement. (laughs) We expected the Oilers to be in the basement, not the Canucks. Well, that's the thing. I think somehow people keep expecting the Oilers to take the next step or or take a step. The next step would imply some sort of positive progress, which there really hasn't been. But I think it's fascinating that both the Canucks and the Rangers, after basically trading head coaches, are neither team is it res- is responding really at all to the new culture. And sometimes that does take a while. I mean, it it can take some time for a coach to get in with a new roster, to get them playing the, that coach's way, all that sort of thing. So I think we got to give those two teams a little bit more time. In the same way that you're, in the same way that you've got to temper expectations with the start the Flames have had, you can't write off teams like the Rangers and the Canucks five games into a year. You could write off the Oilers, but teams that have been there before, 
really, uh, I, I think, are allowed to get off to slow starts, as we saw for the first couple of years out of the lockout when the Flames were making the playoffs consistently. Yeah. I mean, it's a long season. There's 77 games left for the Flames, so just because they've won five doesn't mean anything. Or not won five, but haven't lost in regulation in five doesn't really mean anything. We still have a lot of hockey left to play. But that brings me to the next question I wanted to ask you guys. I know there's a lot of people, us included, um, who have been talking about how great it is to see the Flames off to a good start, um, what this could mean for the team if they can get into the playoffs. We've already talked about that. But, guys, what do you think? When does a good start turn into a good season? What's it going to take for us to say, you know what, the Flames aren't having a good start anymore. This actually starts to look like a good season that they're putting together. I'd say at the very minimum, you have to look at the 20 game mark. And if after 20 games, they're still in that, you know, four to in that range between four and eight, then okay, this is a good start. It's five games, a five game sample size in any sport outside of like the NFL is basically irrelevant. Uh, it's nice for now. To their credit, they are super fun to watch. But, yeah, 20 games and then we can reevaluate if this is a good start or if this is a good season. So the 20th game will be November 16th against the Oilers. So hopefully they can win at least the 20th game. But I'm going to mark that on the calendar and discuss it again after 20 yeah. then. Well, if you remember back to 2 3 the Flames got off to that ridiculous start winning like 16 of the first 20 games. And like everybody's like, oh, we're going to make the playoffs and all that. And then it kind of collapsed. It, it, if they can keep the same effort levels beyond even the 20 game mark and, you know, just that same relentless forecheck that they've been going under, if that is, remains consistent beyond that point, then you could actually start envisioning that they might be a good team and a possible playoff threat. But if they start losing that effort level and the consistency of their forecheck in that, then things might get a little more dicey and then it's just more of a hot start versus an actual legitimate good team. So I think we can all agree probably about mid-November to early December is when we need to look at this team to really evaluate if they're a good team or just had a lucky uh, start? Probably December-ish, maybe January, depending. You know, like if they're still like in the top four by January, then I think you can say that, yeah, this team should be a playoff team. But, you know, there are too many ifs and maybes between now and then. If they're in the top four in January, you need to hand Bob Hartley Coach of the Year right then. Um, straight up. I, I don't know how, like, black magic and sorcery, that's how I'd imagine this team is in the top four in twenty in the beginning of twenty fourteen. And I know that's pessimistic, but good lord. Um was two thousand two, two thousand three, was that the year we extended Roman Turek after his nice start, or was that the year before? No, that was the year. Yeah, they gave him the contract right at the like twenty game mark and then he proceeded to not be very good. I mean I guess that makes sense when it, when you think of like athletes uh mailing it in not even mailing it in, just falling off after they sign big ticket extensions. Like, complacency has to set in. Because you just, I don't know, you did it. You won. And you can be like, yeah, I want to earn it. And that's what makes great players great, I suppose. But, I mean, I'm sure all of us have had moments at work where we have a nice hot streak, we get some financial success, and then all of a sudden it's like, I oh, sort of just start letting off the gas a bit, and then before, you know, boom, you have a you have a crappier month. So you're kind of saying that the flames have to keep their foot on the gas in order to power through this and not let it off and exactly. fall down. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just yeah I'm just saying that complacency sets in in every single situation in life if things are going well, and I suppose like good teams like your 
Chicago's, Boston's, LA's recognize that as good as things may be going at any given moment in time, it's not the goal for things to be going well right now. But you can feel good about yourself when you've got the shiny silver thing above your head. And comparatively to, the, say, the previous three generations of Flames, uh, which got way too happy with themselves after a couple of games where, you know, Iggy had four points and, uh, you know, Tange had a nice play on the power play. Uh, there's a very palpable lack of satisfaction in the performances thus far. You know, one thing, every time I hear an interview with Bob Hartley this year, he's, and I don't know if it's different than other years, or they're just talking about it more, but it seems like this team is doing a lot more off the ice together. I mean, they've they've been talking about how this team is not just going out for dinner and stuff like we often hear, but this team is actually going to, like, the firefighter training here in town and having to spot each other while they do that. Um, it sounds like they just played paintball and hockey against the Canadian Forces. So I think there's something to be said for this team working together off the ice and that that's going to help with the chemistry well, on the ice. During the offseason at the, at the season ticket holder meeting, uh, Conroy was mentioning that specifically where the leadership on the team had to be more inclusive with all the new young players that are coming through and making sure that they're feeling like a part of the organization itself instead of, you know, just letting them do their own thing. And, you know, that you're seeing that camaraderie, like when Boma had blocked those shots in the Devils game, Berchi was the first one to hit him on the head when he got to the bench. And, you know, so it's good. And that's how you build an actual team instead of a group of individuals like Edmonton's doing. Well, I mean, if you even go back to... If you even go back to minor hockey, when I don't know if you guys played, I believe Dan, you did for sure. I don't know about you, Matt. You played? Uh, not Matt? in actual any organized way. No. <laughs> okay. Well, then Dan, I mean, I'm sure you'll remember this. That like going to hockey, you know, it, it is obviously you don't like you don't always love everyone on your team, but it is a, a great moment where like two, three times a week you hang around with, you know. 15 other guys that you really get along with and you really have a lot of fun with. And maybe it was just the realization that none of... The, the, possible, well, okay, how do I say this? Um, previous generations of the Flames, last couple of years, have on some level known they weren't good enough and thus didn't want to be around that atmosphere, those people who they knew at a certain point, weren't going to be able to get it done. So the less they thought about that, the easier life was to deal with for them. Um, these guys don't have that sort of uh, black cloud over them. So, yeah, have fun. This is the, These are the best years of your life, guys. So, you know, you're living the dream. Well, like... <laughs> Every single one of them needs to, you know, they all need to go out and buy matching sports cars and, uh, you know, something team buildy like that and just have a blast because, you know. It's interesting you mentioned the minor hockey thing because, I mean, my favorite years in minor hockey, I had the same coach for about four years, and he did what Bob Hartley's doing now. He would hold team pizza parties. We'd all go to his house on a Friday night and just hang out. And you did. You felt a better camaraderie with these people. Even though you didn't want to be with them, you got to know them both on and off the ice. And you got to know a little bit more about them. And you felt more like an organized group, not just a bunch of individual freelancers out there. So I know that really helped me. I mean, we weren't a good team half those years, but we played like a, a cohesive unit. And I think that really helped out. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. By the way, five city championships. Count them. Hell yeah, that's... Which city, Calgary? Yeah, Calgary. Here in Calgary you won them? Provincial, uh, provincial finalists in Halifax in Adam A. Yeah, it exists. Set a, set a Halifax Hawks Community Association record for consecutive shutouts with eight. And then I didn't get another one for the rest of the year, which really chapped my ass. Even as a... As a, as a how old was I? Ten? I, I, I knew enough to be upset at that. So you were a goalie. 
And obviously our friend here, Matt, the cage great. You were yeah. obviously a goalie. In the handful of times that I played, yeah. So I'm the only guy that was scared of the puck and couldn't be goal on this panel. Dude, if you're scared of the puck, the best place to be is in goal. Nothing hurts. No, the best place for me to be was on the wing because then I could just take guys down. I was the biggest kid on my team. They used to call me the wall. I suppose, but I mean, if you think about it, you're you're on the wing. Your job is to guard the points, and you know nobody tends to shoot harder than those defensemen loading up one timers and whatnot. So, I don't know. I, I my last year of hockey, I played uh, I played wing, and uh, I, I remember taking a couple shots off just the the. Uh, the bottom of my shin which made my entire uh, foot go numb and you know that wasn't pleasant i was like that's never happened to me before i've been doing this for you know i've been doing this for nine years the first time it happened I, I i blocked a shot with just player stuff on and I, I just went back to the bench and thinking this is what you people do you guys are crazy what a dumb idea let me handle it or let, let the goalie handle it. It was difficult for me to let go. <laughs> so if we look at the Flames roster right now, we've got Camilleri, Jones, and Stajan all hurt. I mean, we're five games in, and the injuries are already starting to mount. Are either of you guys worried that injuries might get to be too much and the Flames might end up losing the good streak they're putting together because they have too many guys hurt, too many key guys hurt? Uh, not really. The thing is that, uh, the Flames have this year that they didn't really have last year or the year prior is that there are several guys that are in Abbotsford that can easily step in and you won't really notice that much of a difference. You know, Corbin Knight, Roman Horak, like all those type of guys, like they can easily come in and fill a top nine position without issue. So, you know, like, yeah, the injuries suck, but you know, if you're playing the style that we are, you're going to get banged up a bit. There's also the element of essentially zero expectations uh, that I suppose prevents me as a fan from really getting too stressed out about anything, I don't know, derailing the current win-loss record. Because going you know we had a whole summer to prepare ourselves for a reality where it wasn't about the wins and losses it was about the development of certain key players or not or just a, a reestablishing of a culture and an identity so you know the injuries aren't good losing david jones sucks he was really he looked like he was uh, a really good fit but he'll be back um you know you know, take the, the good start, fun start with the injuries and, you know, move on. Are you guys excited that as good as this roster is looking so far, that when we start getting guys like um, Mike Camilleri and Matt Stajan back, that we could look even better? Eh, yes and no. Like, yeah, I'm looking forward to them being back, but realistically, I haven't really noticed that they're not in the lineup. So, yeah, it's good in, you know, every manner, you know, like... Well, that means we've been able to backfill pretty well. I... I almost don't... I don't know. Like, Camilleri, I don't even know who he's going to play with. I suppose it, if and when he comes back, he'd slot in... Before, he's going to be back before David Jones, so I guess he slots in on the Glen Cross line with Ben Street. Um... Stajan, I mean, obviously any NHL centerman that we get back is going to help. So, Matt Stajan always has the ability to look like he's just, no matter what line he's playing on, he's just half a step behind everyone. And he could be playing on the fourth line, he'd look half a step behind, um, who's a fourth liner? Oh, God. I'm, I'm blanking on fourth liners from other teams right now. But he, And he'd be half a step behind. He could be playing though, against Ryan Getzlaff, and he'd be half a step behind Ryan Getzlaff. And you just wonder, look at him and go, why don't you have that extra gear? Unless he's playing that shadowy type defensive game, but am I wrong in that? Does anyone else notice that? No, he seems to play to the level of his opposition and his line mates, whatever that is. 
It's kind of weird. That, that's like the worst quality you could have as a professional athlete. Pretty much. It's not even a matter of busting his ass. It's just like, Matt Stajan is not a bad skater. He doesn't have bad hands. He's not a bad passer. Yet, the, the sum total of everything that Matt Stajan is feels like, just it's just not feels like it is, less than what it should be. And it's confusing to me. I really have to wonder what the first meeting between he and Burke was like. Now Burke's here in Calgary. I mean, you know, Burke got rid of him in Toronto because... I'm sure it's fine. When it comes to, you know, Matt Stage and being traded, and I'll always remember that the Oilers had a deal in place, or, or not in place, but fairly close to being cons consummated for Chris Pronger to go to Toronto. And it was held up, or it fell through rather, because John Ferguson Jr. didn't want to include Matt Stajan. And that's, uh... and then later he would be traded for FNF, obviously. But I, I'm not sure what the parallel there is, if anything. But uh, I suppose the, the message there is, if there's a chance to trade for a defenseman and you can send Matt Stajan back, you should probably do it. Matt Stajan actually had some decent years in Toronto. I'm looking at his stats here. The year, um, the year that we acquired him, he played 51 games and got 41 points. The year before that, he played 76 games and got 55 points. So he's had some productive years in the past, and I think it's a question of how can the Flames get him back on track to have the same kind of production here. Maybe it would be putting him on a line with some of the guys we have now. Maybe it would be... You know, putting him on uh, the first line with different line mates in a different at atmosphere for this team. Because as we've all said, the team seems like they have a better atmosphere and attitude this year. That alone might end up helping him produce they better. They do, and, and let's not forget, Staten had a decent year last year as well. But it's just, an, uh, my, my comments are more like an observation on him as a player. It, And Matt's right, like he plays to the level of his immediate surroundings, like from shift to shift. But it's never a le and it's never a level of I'm gonna dominate you. It's all right. I can. This is how fast I need to go to keep up with this guy, which is why he probably gets the defensively responsible label because he's never behind anyone. It's never like Matt Stage is being beaten by ten or or fifteen feet on a on a stretch pass or something. He you know. He's a decent player. It's just there's, an, I think there's an intensity issue going on there, and I, I imagine whoever managed to crack that code would find themselves with a very productive hockey player on their hands. Yeah, and it's just going to be a matter of cracking that, I think, and figuring out what makes him tick and how to get him productive again. Maybe Harley's the guy for the job. Who knows? Well, either way, if they can't figure it out, then at least he's a free agent at the end of the year. So, you know, <laughs> if worst case scenario, you know, you don't have to worry about him for an extended period. Yeah, as bad as the contract was when he signed it and everyone was going like, why did, why, 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 why? It really hasn't been the most frustrating contract to get through in terms of him as a player like it, it's gone by really quickly like blink and you've missed matt stage 10 years of flame even though it's four and a half years long do you think part of that is that we've had worse contracts as as uh, fans we've been more worried about i think it's because honestly i think it's because we've never in since he's been here we've never been in a position where our lack of cap flexibility truly prevented us from achieving greatness. It's not like Matt Stajan's contract held us back from getting that one piece that was going to put us over the top. We haven't mattered enough for Matt Stajan's contract to be truly awful. So guys, here's another question for you. We have two games this week. Uh, we play two away games, one against the Ducks, one against the Sharks. Who do you start net for those games? Do you stay with the goalie that we have so far, which is Joey McDonald, who's racked up the wins, or do you go back to Kerry Ramo, the guy that everyone thought would be the uh, starter coming in? I personally season? would keep going with Mac just because he's looked good, and if he 
you know, like, win, play until you lose. And if he keeps winning, just let him keep going out there. You know, he hasn't looked bad. And, you know, it gives more time for Ramo to adjust to his positioning in the net for the North American game versus the Euro game. I would, yeah, obviously I think you, I think obviously you start Ramo, or not Ramo, uh, McDonald uh, in the game on Wednesday against Anaheim. And I suppose you play it by ears if you want uh, him to go against the Sharks. Uh, as someone who our listeners will know, I have not said a whole lot. Like, I've never not, not said a whole lot. Um, I haven't ever been overtly supportive of Joey McDonald as the Flames goaltender going back to the moment he was claimed on waivers even when it became a possibility, because I think we discussed it before he actually got to Calgary. Uh, I I like him this year. He's scrappy. He he tries hard. He He's not a traditional blocking butterfly goalie. He's made some terrific eye-catching saves. And, you know, I like the guy. And his teammates clearly like playing for him. So I suppose, you know... There's worse guys and worse attitudes to have between your net. Um, however, th- there is definitely a... Uh, th- there are enough holes in his fundamental game that I think it's not unreasonable to expect a regression to come soon because he just... There are holes there. NHL players, once they get a chance to prepare for it, uh, will spot them and then... He'll go back to you know he'll st- I think he'll still be a decent scrappy guy for us, but I don't know that his early season success is indicative of anything longer term yet. And this time next week we have the Kings and the Coyotes in a back to back Monday Tuesday. So I think either way you're going to see Ramo within the next four games because I think Ramo is going to play one of the back to back. So I think it'll give us as fans another chance to see him and judge how he's doing at adjusting the North American game. But yeah, I agree with you. I don't think that Max, the guy going forward for the rest of the season, I think he's on a hot streak. Let's ride the hot streak. And hopefully we can get Ramo on a hot streak when he takes over as the starting goaltender. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think it would benefit the team overall to get uh, each of those guys into two games. But, you know, if it's three McDonald, one Ramo... You know, it's not a huge deal to me. One thing I do have to bring up as an aside is how good Dennis Weidman has been playing. You know, ever since we traded Sarich, like, he he took number six off him when he left, and, you know, the amount of good, solid hits, in addition to his regular play, he's been fantastic to start the year. So I just want to give him, uh, you know, applause <laughs> for that. Uh, Weidman's been really good. He uh, He's made good passes. He's been pretty good defensively. His physical presence was unseen last year. But he, uh, yeah, he's good for apparently one really solid open ice hit a game now. Yeah, I've been a fan of Weidman, I think I've said here on the show, since we acquired him. I thought he was a good acquisition for this team. I thought the price was a little bit steep at the time, but nothing that we couldn't stomach. And yeah, I'm really liking what I see from him this year. I think Hartley is letting these guys play their game or play the game they want to play more than we have in the past. And I think that Weidman, we're seeing the natural Dennis Weidman. Dennis Weidman playing Dennis Weidman's game, not Dennis Weidman trying to fit into a certain mold. I think we're seeing that with a lot of guys in this team. There's definitely, definitely. an element of n- not uh, trying to force square pegs into round holes. Uh, there's a better recognition of skill sets. But, you know, again, we'll, we'll see how things play out. You guys, I thought we'd uh, update. I know you guys haven't been following the Heat so far, but I thought we'd give everyone an update on how they're doing. Uh, the Heat season has started. They're four games in. And they play in series in the NHL, so they tend to play the same team two or three times in a row. And so they started their season um, with a 5-2 win, 
and then they had a 2-3 loss, another 3-2 win, and a 2-1 shootout loss. So they've had, uh, or a, so they have two wins, one loss, and one shootout loss so far. And I've watched a couple of the games. I'm really liking what I see. The young guys on that team, um, a lot of our young guys, especially the ones that have some NHL experience, like Horak, Byron, guys like that, um, they're looking good. I'm really liking what I'm seeing, and I think those guys will be brought up this year sometime. The big news there that I wanted to share, though, especially with what we've been talking about with the goalies, is that the Flames have made a, a move um, in net. Ordeo has been sent down to Alaska, and Brassois has been recalled to the HL. So I don't know if that means Brassois and Barrow will be playing a 1A, 1B game, or one of them is going to back up the other. But I find that kind of interesting that we now have Brassois and Barra both at the well, HL level. I think that uh, the reason that they sent Ordeo down was that they, I don't think they were expecting Barra to be that good to start the season, and that they obviously are wanting him to spend more time in the net because he had such a good start. And, you know, Brassois, he's just entering his pro career, so you have more time to allow him to s sit on the bench and that, where Ordeo's more, like, getting close to needing to actually show that he has NHL abilities, so he needs to play more. And the AHL and the ECHL, from a goalie's point of view, is not that big of a difference in terms of quality of shots. So, you know, just getting on the ice is more important. So I think that's why Makes sense. that roster move was made. Yeah, I was just kind of surprised because it seemed like the top two goalies are both on the AHL team now, and I would have expected that they would have wanted Brassois somewhere where he's the number one guy. But yeah, you could be very right. It's kind of a chance for Brassois to sit and watch someone who knows what they're doing. And it's good that Ordeo is impressing. I mean, that's what we want is guys that we weren't expecting to have great seasons have great seasons. Yeah. Barra looks like he might actually be able to, like in a month or two, if he keeps up with this good level of play, come in and into Calgary and take the starting position away. So you have to see if he actually has that ability or if he, like McDonald, is just having a immediate hot start before he starts returning to the norm. So, Excellent. Good for you, Rito Barra. Good for him. That Those are my thoughts. It's good that, you know, he's coming down, I believe his goals against is under two. Uh, yeah, good for him. Hope to see him up because uh, he, he was far and away, I think, the most intriguing goalie we had in camp. Possibly just because of his size, but, you know, the skill set looked to be there. So if he's tearing up the AHL, hopefully we see him in the near future, and uh, maybe that also motivates Ramo to step his game up a bit. Competition's always a good thing. So you guys think that overall that piece of the Bowmeister deal has served yes. us well? Well, getting him and Poirier seems to be a win thus far. Well, even Kandari's looking like a win in my books. Let's, let's yeah. make sure he plays a little bit more in the NHL first, but definitely I... I I really liked what I saw from Kandari last year. Uh, I'd like to see him at the NHL level again, and I'm sure we will at a certain point this season. But, yeah, for the moment, let's... Uh, let, let's I would be surprised let's, if we didn't see him this season. I'd be astonished. I, I just, uh, I'm hesitant to say anything like is a, is a win in, in, a, in terms of a trade a mere six months after it happened. Well, I'm not necessarily saying that we won the trade, but I think that it's looking good from a Flames perspective. We've had a lot of trades lately where Flames fans have felt that we really lost on the trade. So I think that we're all feeling that where we are right now and what this organization needs, the Flames got pieces that work towards that goal. Definitely. Oh, for sure. I, I, yeah, definitely. This wasn't the, um, in the last couple, uh, or how do I say this? The last several, um, major loss trades that plague this organization have not occurred in the last uh, 18 months, for whatever that's worth. Like, this isn't Butler and Byron for Regeer and Kotalik in a second. This is, you know, maybe not the best deal ever we could have gotten, but it looks like we got potentially three very useful pieces. 
as much as we've been talking about some of the problems that we've been having with the flames, at least we don't have the kind of issues that our friends up north are having. And in our weekly Edmonton bashing segment, let's turn over to Luke to talk about what's going on with Yakupov. Well, Nail Yakupov has been scratched the last two games. Now, I don't, as far as I know, the Oilers have not won either of those games. Um, am I right? Am I wrong? Yeah, they did lose again tonight. The... Okay, so they've lost both games now. And he was scratched yeah, tonight? Against the Capitals. Now, it's I'm sure it's not necessarily fair to blame your shortcomings on uh, your 20-year-old first overall pick from last year. However... Uh, especially when Devin Dubnik's your starting goalie and Jason LaBarbera is your backup. Um, this quote sort of sums up why uh, they should have taken Ryan Murray. Um, Yakupov, I'm going to play my game, he said. I'm not going to change, but maybe play better without the puck or forecheck more. But I love playing with the puck. I really don't like skating all the time and forechecking and hitting somebody every shift. I don't think that's my game. Yakupov. Now, why is that attitude on your team? From a winger, no less. Remember that episode last year? I think it was like two or three. Wingers are selfish and stupid. Nail Yakupov. Selfish and stupid. Well, I mean, there's there's definitely a language barrier there, and so that's going to be some of it when you read that quote. But do you think that perhaps Yakupov came over here expecting something, expecting to be handed a certain job or a certain role in the team, and is now perhaps upset that he has to work to earn a spot? Well, why wouldn't he expect to be handed something? It's the Edmonton Oilers' M.O. for this rebuild. Let's just put the 18-year-olds on the first line and call it a life. So... And, you know, last year he scores 17 goals, gets 14 assists in a shortened season. He looked good. Obviously, he's got some sort of ability to play in the league. However, it's going back to the quote, I really don't like skating all the time and forechecking and hitting somebody on every shift. I don't think it's my game. Well, that's the North American game, my friend. Go back to Russia. Yeah, realistically... So you you said before the show that there were rumors he was thinking about going over to Russia. Is that correct? I had heard conflicting stuff on the Russia stuff. Uh, basically, I don't know. I'm sure if he wanted to go, the KHL and, uh, and their ilk would love to have him. Uh, I don't know... I don't know. It seems silly to think that after two healthy scratch games, the player is just going to run back and go to the go to Russia because that, you know, if, if that... Well, and if he were to do that, you know he'd never be welcome back in the NHL again. So you really shoot yourself in the foot this early in your NHL well, career. Well, if I was Edmonton's general manager, like, I would seriously be considering moving him to another city like, for example, like, Buffalo, they're having just as much problems, but they, R Buffalo itself has a huge Russian community in the city, so at least they're, like, you know, with the, the Sabres, they got Tyler Myers, who's struggling, and they have Ryan Miller, so, like, it, they could address some of their actual needs with the team in a trade with them. I think you need to start looking at possibly moving him to a situation where he'd be more comfortable because I think he's going to be a complete gong show if they don't address it immediately. Well, here's the thing, though. Like, if that attitude exists, why is why is he even on your team? Like, he shouldn't... Why, why would anyone want him? Well, he, he's not unskilled. Like, he could easily develop into a 30-40 goal scorer. It's just he needs to play his own game. And if he doesn't like his situation, he's going to take his ball and go home. And, you know, like, the Devils just saw this with Kovalchuk. It's the same situation. It's just a different player. And, you know, it, 
unfortunately for the Oilers, they have to possibly lose someone that could be good just because he's got an attitude problem. I think as a GM, though, I'm less likely to bring him in because he, we know what his attitude is. If Edmonton's GM calls me up and says, hey, do you want Yakupov? I know what his attitude is. I know um, why they want to pawn him off to me, and I'm going to be less likely as a GM to give you anything of value back for him because he is a wild card. Well, that's why I brought for up sure. Buffalo, because uh, with Tyler Myers, he's been pretty bad for the last year and a half, and he still has, like, five or six years of five and a half million dollars as his cap hit so at least like they'd be able to pawn off something that you know is a long-term liability for themselves you know like you're not going to be getting someone that's actually legitimately good for their cap hit in exchange for a guy like Yakupov you're going to get somebody else with warts but perhaps that you could mold into something useful for yourself, not, you know, a head case. And that's all you'd want, I suppose. But I suppose to go back to your Matt, point, Matt, about what happened with Kovalchuk, Kovalchuk had actually done things. And Kovalchuk was a hard worker, and he may not have been the best defensively, but at a certain point I think he realized, I just want to stay in Russia. And there's, you know, it's difficult to fault a guy for that. This guy is not getting his way after two games and considering bolting to the KHL. Now, you can't have that attitude on your team. That that dude no. needs to be gone by the end of the week. Yeah, I or agree wholeheartedly. You're going to be drafting higher than us again. Yeah, I agree with both of you. I think there is another non-hockey side to this, which is always the PR side, which... The Oilers made this pick. They, I mean, they had the first overall pick. They could have picked anybody. They picked this guy. And then the Oilers get rid of him already. There's going to be a huge black guy on the Oilers' front office there. And I think because of that, the Oilers' front office may be a little bit more hesitant to make that deal. O Oilers, the Oilers' front office is such a mess that if they did have a mug, a, a, a mug shot of, I don't know, well, their mug, it would basically look like that Rihanna photo. They're awful. They don't know what they're doing. And I don't care how many cups Kevin Lowe won as a player. He wasn't responsible for building a damn thing. And yes, apparently getting Chris Pronger is good, is, is a guarantee for at least one run to the Stanley Cup Finals. Let's not act like that makes you, you know, oh, let's go get the best defenseman of the generation who's not Nick Lidstrom. What? Yeah. You know what? Kevin Lowe never change. Stay there. Keep hiring your friends and see what happens. Well, let's uh, let's move your focus away from Kevin Lowe then to Tim Erickson, who was recently demoted to the HL. The guy that the Flames traded away, the sh uh, shining star for the Flames at the time, who everyone thought, oh no, we're trading him away, we're not going to get anything back. And we got Horak, and then we got a pick where we selected Granlin, and a pick where we selected Wortherspoon. Yeah, and Wotherspoon looks to be the best of the three prospects that we got back, but all three look like they'll be at quality NHL players. So do you guys think another trade that we can say as Flames fans that we've got what we need from it? Maybe we can't say we've won it yet, but we have the pieces we need organizationally from that team or from that trade? I think a lot of these trades, this just we haven't won them, but we haven't lost them yet either, so... That's that's what matters at this point. We're playing the long game. Yeah, definitely. Like with each of them of the recent ones, we've got pieces back that look to as it is right now to be quality pieces. Whether or not they take the steps forward to becoming NHLers or not, you know, that's in their court, but as of like right this minute that each of the trades that we've made recently have been good. And I mean, those trades could end up not being uh, pieces the Flames use going forward, but pieces they could parlay into a trade for a bigger piece as well. So I think it's always tough to say you've won or lost a trade for certain, but I think looking at where we are right now and what we need in the organization at this time, I think we can definitely say, yeah, the Flames have got a good deal and got the pieces they need for where we are. Hell yeah. 
Well, guys, uh, let's wrap this up so we can get back to our Thanksgivings. Anyone else have anything they want to talk about? As usual, then, I think we'll remind everyone that you can uh, follow us all over the web. You can go to our website at firesidechat.ca. That's where you can find the new shows, the newest articles that we write about the flames happening. Uh, if you're on Twitter, we'd love to have you follow us and talk to us there. Um, our Twitter handle is at Fireside Podcast. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Fireside Chat, as well as Google+. You can find all those links, if you can't remember them, at firesidechat.ca. And subscribe to us through your favorite uh, podcast service, either right from our website or through iTunes. And now we're also available on Stitcher. So any of those, subscribe to us. Uh, make sure you get the newest episode every week. And let your friends know to come listen to us. And guys, I think we can all say it's a great time to be a Flames fan, and we can't wait for the next week. Go Flames, yeah, go. Yeah, follow me. Yeah, I'm at Luke1701. Matt's at Cage. Great. Uh, go Flames. Don't follow me. Follow those two. Don't follow me. I'm not interesting. Go Flames, go. Suck it, Tom. We are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.